Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Always Be Testing podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Grange, and today we got Bobby Callahan. Hi, Bobby. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Got some really good conversations and uh, excited to dive into the world of email marketing and SMS, man. Hell yeah. Everyone's favorite topic. (laughs) Exactly. I I don't think enough people, I think people have started to talk more about it and share more. And and I think, I think you're smart to to tackle that space. Um, Excited to dive in with you. Hell yeah. Absolutely. How's, how's your week going? It's going well, man. Um, Q one's an exciting time. Uh, you know, a lot of conversations happening, and uh, coming out of Q four, you know, we crush it for our clients, and then coming into Q one, we can kind of build the agency more. And there's a lot of turbulence, a lot of people talking about different things, and so it's a lot of fun to build in Q one. And and so this week has been full of Q one type things. How about you? Yeah, similarly, I definitely feel you. It's I think people are got their their stuff together. They're still folks figuring out budgets and plans and strategy, but uh, it's fast and furious in a good way, all the ways that we want it to be right now. So uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, Maybe tell the audience a little bit. So what is it you do? And maybe explain like a very, very simply, what, what is, how would you break down what you do? Yeah. So my name is Bobby and I run an agency called Retentio. So that's the word retention without the N. Um, and so we do retention marketing, email and SMS is like our, our main lever that we pull. Um, but we work with subscription brands. We do direct mail. We do a bunch of other stuff, loyalty, et cetera. Um, that kind of falls under that retention ecosystem. Um, but our main kind of tools are email and SMS. That's awesome. That's awesome. And when you look at email and SMS, what are some of the things that just kind of breaking down super simple and high level, like what is it you're, you're really focused on? What do clients task you with doing within email and, and SMS? Yeah. So high level, you know, we send campaigns, we set up automations. Um, our whole job is to make sure that we're collecting emails. Uh, people spend a lot of money on traffic. And so we want to make sure those leads are, you know, collected at some rate. Um, and then we do our, our, uh, our best to nurture an audience. You know, we're, we're not about just selling all the time. We try and nurture people through content and really build the funnel up. And then when there's a big moment, whether that's Black Friday, Black Friday Cyber Monday or Father's Day or anything like that, um, we, we look for opportunities to clear that funnel out. And so we build the funnel up by nurturing these leads. Um, and then when we can, we clear it up. And so kind of rinse and repeat, do that, set up automations. And at the end of the day, just try to send the right message to the right person at the right time. That's awesome. That's awesome. So nothing really acquisition focused, all centered around the retention ecosystem and kind of keeping customers. Is that accurate? I would say that's kind of our main positioning. Mm -hmm. Um, But Mm -hmm. a lot of email is, is the pop up collecting enough emails? Um, How's the welcome flow doing? And so although the name of my agency is Retentio, retention starts at acquisition. Um, That is like step one of retention. And so we do need to acquire people properly so that we can get them to stick around. And so although retention focused, Retentio branded, um, acquisition is a big part of this that we take on as well. Awesome. Very cool. And how did you get into it? How did this all come about? Yeah. Um, so my big thing is whenever whenever I have to make a decision, I usually try to figure out what is my weakness and I try to make that into my strength. Um, and so going into COVID, I owned my own small brand. Um, it was in home fitness and so it really grew. All the gyms were closed um, and I was just acquiring customers as quickly as I could. And when the post COVID hangover happened and I didn't focus on retention or email or these things, uh, that brand, unfortunately, you know, passed away. It did not make the cut. Um, Mm -hmm. and so Mm -hmm. looking at that, I really was like, why did this happen? What could I have done better? Like, what was my blind spot and weakness? Um, email, SMS, retention, all those sorts of things. That was the answer. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to now try and turn that into my biggest strength. And so I started, started just learning as much as I could started working with brands couple years later, here I am. And uh, I think I did that. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I, I love the idea of taking a, a weakness or a, 
or what may may you know be deemed a failure into more of a learning and that's just you know it's central to what I think many of us as marketers and business people have experienced in life and in business and you, you kind of turn those you know, those challenges or those learnings into new opportunities and some of your bigger biggest ones and so congratulations for viewing things that way and it's commendable not everybody does that so that's really cool what, yeah, when it you it sucks oh, in sorry the go ahead yeah it sucks in the moment for sure but then with enough like compounding when you start to feel like oh now this is no longer a weakness it's a pretty good feeling so i try to do that as much as i can yeah i think it kind of sharpens the the edge and and your um, see you have less blind spots after you go through some of those challenging times uh they, they make you stronger and smarter and a better better operator in a lot of ways so commendable um what what about in terms of looking at you know talent uh you know you're building out a team you're you're courting really interesting exciting customers like what do you look for with with email marketers what do you what are some of the things maybe you train for or um, optimize for or interview for when you're bringing together you know teams and talent and systems for for clients yeah um there's a lot of things for sure email marketing specifically i would say you're kind of combining art and science and a lot of marketing that's what you're doing um mm -hmm. and so there's mm -hmm. like the design eye the creative eye the creative mind but then there's also like the analytical you know opportunity to like review what you're doing hypothesize how things could be better you know the name of this podcast always be testing like that's very important to me um and so being able to kind of switch from a creative to an analytic um we, we have a small team so people wear multiple hats sometimes and so kind of just being able to switch between the two and kind of hang in both of those conversations is something that i look for um because sometimes when a creative talks to a more technically minded person or analytical person it's like not apples and oranges and they kind of don't see each other eye to eye and so i really look for mm -hmm. people that can kind of see both sides of the coin um, and I think that makes for a lot more synergy and, and better execution uh, when we try to communicate things through email. That's awesome. And, and do you think like in your stage right now, you're able to kind of find folks that are able to be pretty good at both the analytical and the creative, or are you finding you have to kind of uh, be more focused at this stage? Uh, yeah. So, so we're just onboarding like a creative person. Um, I would say we're starting to segment a little bit more. I think at the beginning, it was definitely wearing both hats. Um, but mm -hmm. as we grow a little bit more, it's like, yeah, we have a creative person, we have a strategist person, um, and really segmenting those things out so that they can stay in their lane and really work deeply there. Uh, but that being said, it's still very important to me that a strategist and a creative and whoever else can have organic conversations together and see each other's perspective as much as possible. Um, so trying to foster yeah. that even though they work in totally uh, different ends of the spectrum. I like where your head's at with that. I feel like it makes sense to have more generalists early on. As you grow, you're kind of getting more specific, very laser focused individuals over time to enable that scale. But still there's a kind of a benefit to an analytical person really understanding elements of the creative side, understanding what levers that you can pull as an email marketer and, and as a retention expert and, and conversely on the other side. So I really like, I really like that framework that you're coming up with. Yeah, totally. I, uh, personally, I really enjoy e-commerce. So e-commerce is a generalist game. So I do my best to be a good generalist, um, which allows me to kind of, you know, get someone who's a creative and get someone who's a strategist and sit them down and be like, Hey, this is how you see things this is how you see things. Um, I might not be the best at either one of them as a generalist, but, uh, being able to speak the language of both is, is something that I think e-commerce operators should be able to do. Yeah. We, we've talked about that concept of like generalist versus specialist a lot on our team. And, um, one teammate uh, and I talk a lot about, there's a book called range. I don't know if you've, you've read that one pretty good check, check it out yeah definitely talks a lot about like the value of being a generalist and you know there's definitely uh hot takes and uh, strong opinions on that one if you 
talk to people in the uh, D2C e-com marketing world, but um, it's, a, it's a worthy one regardless of where you stand on the topic. Cool. Cool, man. Love it. Um, what, what kind of client are you finding kind of, you know, nails it for what you're doing for them or on in the world of retention and email and SMS marketing? What kind of challenges are they facing? What kind of stage are they in? Yeah, totally. So we take brands that are doing about 120K a month to 300K a month, and we look to, to grow them. Um, so we take smaller brands. Um, what's naturally happened for us is we're seeing that there really is like a business model channel fit. Uh, and what I mean by that is a, a lot of the clients that we crush for the most are subscription. They have a subscription mm -hmm. D2C product. Mm -hmm. um, and in retention, it's like it's easier to get someone to not unsubscribe than it is to get them to make another purchase. And so we deal a lot with churn and we deal a lot with uh, keeping people rather than winning people back with those kind of customers. And I think that, you know, direct to consumer subscription, there's just a synergy there. And like they have healthy repeat order rates, you know, healthy margins. They're able to really grow. Um, and it's just, yeah, we've just seen that naturally that's kind of where we've niched into, like not really on purpose. We just kind of crushed it for a subscription brand, t took on another, took on another. And now over 70% of our clients are subscription. Um, not to oh, say man. we don't work, not to say we don't work with anybody in direct consumer, but just naturally subscription seems to be a really good business model for the channel. Absolutely. There's so many benefits to it. The LTV, the the value gives a... Gives, uh the opportunity to kind of play with a little bit more. And um, it, it's hard when you're, when you're, you know, chasing that next one off, one off purchase, it can be a little bit more difficult. Um, that's awesome. With your evolution in your career, you know, we talked about this a little bit. Was there kind of like a sliding door moment? I think, I think I might know what you're going to share, but uh, can you share a little bit about like those intersections in your career where you could have gone one direction and, you kind of ended up going to another and kind of how those what learnings kind of came out of it totally so it, my end goal is to start a brand portfolio of brands uh similar to like homestead zach stuck uh, i really admire what he's doing um and Absolutely. so i started off like starting brands and doing that and really uh running like small business type brands and yeah, when, after the COVID hangover, and it was like, do I start another brand or do I go agency? Um, that was a big moment for me because I had to I had to take a different route to get to where still where I want to get to. I still want to get to the mm -hmm. same place, but you know, building the agency and starting to build the team and learning all these things, and I'm in a way better position to start a brand now if I wanted to versus if I just keep trying to start brands over and over again. Um, and so that moment of just moving from brand to agency, knowing that eventually I want to go back to brand, uh, that was a huge moment for me. And uh, honestly, very happy awesome. I did that. Yeah. Yeah. I think one thing that's awesome, I feel like with agency, if you're really in the you know higher percentile of performance, uh, if you're if you're being you know candid and, and solving real problems and going after the right customer, you know cohorts like it can be a business that does quite well and is very stable even through challenging times. I, I was talking to folks recently about, I feel like the winners are emerging in on the average, you know, brand side and winners are emerging on the agency side. And we're getting in a very stringent financial environment where people are very, you know, careful about every dime they spend, which is how it should be. And much more stringent than the, zero interest rate, you know, fantasy land world we were living in a few years ago. And I feel like it's not a bad thing. It kind of shakes out uh, folks. And um, if you can be in that winning category, I think it, you can present a lot of opportunity. And I, I just love how many learnings there are to be had on the agency side. You can then take those learnings back to the brand side down the road if you want to. Yeah, like fair enough. I would start a subscription brand if I was to start one. And I wouldn't have known to do that if I didn't naturally fall into that niche based off what I'm doing. Um, and there's just so many things that I'm seeing on the agency. So I feel like I'm cheat, like it's a cheat code. Like I just get to see all these things and I'm like, okay, this is good. This is bad. Yeah. I can kind of create like a mental checklist of if I did want to 
pursue a brand opportunity, what would that look like? Um, so yeah, yeah. that eight, the agency experience is honestly priceless. Yeah. I love that. The volume of stuff we've learned in the last 10 years is, is insane. Um, and it's been fun to kind of have that you know combination of in-house and, and agency experience. So switching gears a little, thinking about like, you know, the learnings aspect of the pod, like you're running experiments all day long in email. You're doing A-B tests, you're doing testing with SMS and other, you know, retention levers. I'd love to hear, could you share some of the, some of those aha moments or maybe some surprising tests or maybe experiments that you uh, are really were, were impressed by the performance of, like trying to give the audience some things that have really worked well and some, some tactics and strategies that really were, were surprisingly good for you. Totally. Um, so the, the first one that comes to mind is there's the question of one call to action versus multiple call to actions. And so when you make an email, should it be focused on one core thing or should you focus on a couple of things? Cause you don't know what the person is going to click on. Um, it, it may, you could argue it both ways. If anything, I feel like, blindfolded, I could argue that more CTAs might be a better thing. Um, but through testing, like what we've seen is, you know, sometimes when you just focus on one call to action, one message, one offer, one anything, um, it can be a lot more powerful and directed than if you give someone like three different blocks of content or offers to choose from. It's not always the case, but it's just an interesting test to run is, should I be laser focused on this is the piece of content or offer I want to push and, and make sure people are singularly focused going down that path? Or do I give them all these options to click from, which sometimes can cause a little bit of analysis by uh, paralysis by analysis. Um, yeah, this is this isn't always the case. Like there are brands that if you show like, you know, a lot of different things, like it's it's awesome. They have a great uh, catalog, et cetera. But it's a very mm -hmm. interesting test to run because it kind of varies uh, brand to brand. And I'm starting to lean towards team one CTA over multiple. Got it. So you actually seen that some cases, multiple CTAs cannot perform one CTA for some brands, even though that's counterintuitive. Is that right? Yeah, um, I've seen it both ways. So sometimes if you offer a mm -hmm. lot of different options, different products, etc, like, that's the best way to move. Or there's other cases where if you only offer one call to action, just make the uh, email very simple with one product, one offer, one whatever, that can now perform as well. So I kind of would urge people to think about that for their brand and kind of run that test and see, should I be overwhelming yeah. people with all these buttons to click? Or do I just stay laser focused on one message per email or piece yeah. of content? Yeah. And, and talk a little bit about subject lines and kind of like, you know, like that's hotly debated. You, you see all kinds of weird stuff now in subject lines, like forwarding and exclamations. Yeah. And there's the Obama marketing campaign, like legendary stuff they talked about. Yeah, it, was, it seems like ancient history now. What what has worked well in in subject lines, and what are some of the learnings that you've had there? Yeah, um, I can kind of spitball them. So one that is very fifty fifty is emojis. We've done a lot of emoji testing and it really just lands 50 50. Like if you remove it, it didn't really make a difference. If you add it, it didn't really make a difference. I think that's a fun one to point out. Um, being very direct, I think is important. Um, making people, making sure people click on something and then what they're about to click into is congruent with that. Um, there's a little bit of dissonance when you kind of are very clickbaity and then like the content of the email is not aligned with that. And so a lot of the time, like if we have a hero headline, a lot of that DNA is baked into the subject line. Like we want to make sure there's a lot of congruency because the reason they're clicking it is to get what they think they're clicking into for the subject of the email. Um, and so being direct, you know, make sure you let people know if there's an offer inside. Um, you can get cute with it, but sometimes if you get too cute, that's where that dissonance happens where it's like, Mm -hmm. you clicked on it and then like, it wasn't really what you expected. And so, yes, you got the click or you got the open, but uh, that's where it'll stop. And so I think there's a lot to be said about the congruency between the subject line and the actual content itself. And that will yield better results because people are literally micro yes, clicking into that piece of content. If they are then served that piece of content, it's going to perform better. And so you got to be careful not to get too cute um, would be my big learning. Yeah. 
I think that's a good uh, good piece of advice on a number of things. Um, what are some of the things that you think a lot of you know brands get wrong in email and SMS marketing, uh, and you have to kind of you know educate, test, advise? Like, what, what are what are some of the biggest pitfalls that you see? Yeah, so this is maybe a hot take, or or people might disagree, but. I really don't want my brands to become discount brands. Um, that could be a slippery slope. And so there are times where people get themselves in a situation where their audience has offer fatigue. Like they just have been shown offers all the time. And if you really want to get them to purchase, you have to like one up yourself again with an offer. And so being very careful with like, or not even careful, being very intentional about when you discount, how you discount, how often you discount, um, you, you don't want to get yourself in a situation where you have offer fatigue and you have to like fight your way out of that because it's just really hard. And so I would say, be intentional about that, you know, build the funnel and then clear the funnel, build the, fu- you're not always trying to clear the funnel and offer, 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 like your automations and your flows are built to kind of convert people naturally. And so on the campaign side, like that's where you have an opportunity to, nurture and do cool things. Um, if you're trying to compensate on the campaign side, that can hurt you sometimes. Um, and so the biggest pitfall that I see is brands accidentally become discount brands and then they'll have a softer black Friday, cyber Monday. They'll have a, you know, so do your best to build the funnel and then clear it versus always just hammering an audience with offers. Yeah, interesting. So you're saying clear it more sustainably rather than forcing a clearing or forcing a purchase. You're you're trying to do things to build up the funnel and then, um, you know, clear them out when it makes sense rather than forcing yeah. it upon them. Totally, absolutely, and it's just a little more organic. You'll have bigger days, you know, um, and people will just respond better because they're like, I haven't seen an offer in a minute. Um, and I've been mm-hmm. seeing all this cool stuff about this brand. Now is my time to jump in versus if mm-hmm. they're always getting an offer, there's not like that. Now is this time to jump in. And so like, you yeah, can't as intentionally clear the funnel on a certain day. Yeah, no, that's really cool. When you ingest, you know, phone numbers and le- you know, emails, in your system and you talk about this funnel that you're monitoring uh are there things that you do to validate those numbers not just technically like that they function but like how was this customer acquired why did they come into the ecosystem to make your funnel more quality or is it kind of like let's kind of see how they behave downstream based on what we're doing with with our marketing and messaging and, and time and timing of those messages like can you share a bit more about what you how you think about kind of like the acquisition when it comes into your ecosystem yeah um so the main way we collect is through pop-ups um shout out to amped and matt great pop-up software it has changed a lot of my clients uh email sms programs um Pretty much, you know, we don't we're, we don't really look at it by source. So we're not like this phone number came from TikTok, yeah. this one came from Facebook, etc. Yeah, it, it's more so uh, when a, when a number comes in or a email comes in, they're going to go through like a welcome flow. They're going to go through these mm-hmm. automations, and then they're going to self bucket based off their behaviors. So if they're highly engaged, if they're not engaged with the that initial automation, um, then they're going to be put in the corresponding bucket. If they made a purchase through the welcome flow, they're going to go into a different segment. And so things are dynamically set up that once people come in, regardless of like where they came from, they go through this automation, their behavior is then shown through the automation, and then they're going to dynamically be put in a segment. And then those segments are what we'll like look at. Um, And so people are always moving from segment to segment dynamically. um, And I never know like did they come from tiktok did they come from this or that uh sometimes if we want to run a test maybe we'll do that um but traditionally not as much got it got it um that's super interesting and when you when you are doing segmentation 
what what are some of maybe the learnings that you uh, you and your team have learned from that process and what does that segmentation kind of look like yeah segmentation is a is a is a slippery slope um <laughs> it, it's good to start out simple um so prospect customer vip engaged mm -hmm. just stay simple mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. there's op there's opportunities for you to like over complicate segments and get, again get cute um, that's kind of something mm -hmm. I say a lot is when you get cute with something. Um, and so with segments, you can, I can make up an infinite amount of segments. I can think of all these different reasons why I can think of, a, uh, of, you know, this kind of behavior, this kind of behavior, this kind of person, this kind of person. And I can accidentally create way too many segments, um, and get yourself in a situation where you're trying to make tailored content for all these different segments and it's not producing any sort of lift. Um, and so you have to be careful not to overcomplicate segments, but there is some cool learnings you can get. Um, an example is, let's say there's a subscription box and there's different tiers, um, you know, bronze, silver, gold. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's good to segment those out and see how they respond differently to different things just to get learnings out of it. Uh, but, if, you know, over time, what you'll see is you end up con uh, rolling them back up into simple segments. And so I guess just to say that a little simpler is starting out segmentation very simply, trying to overcomplicate it to find learnings. But then what always ends up happening is you end up rolling back into the simpler segments. Um, and so, you know, prospect, customer, VIP, just engaged in general, yeah. usually that, that's enough. Um, and if you want to yeah. do more than that, you, you got to be careful not to go uh, yeah. slip down that rabbit hole. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And appreciate you diving in on some of these things. It's super interesting and definitely the spirit of the pod. In in terms of other learnings, like when, when people, you know, I've been on internal teams where they're assigning like a revenue number through some of their email efforts. Like how do you think about that email attribution to the retention process? There's definitely, I mean, you can imagine it's it could be massive if you buy a one-off thing and then these emails are kind of like, nudging you down the path of like adding the whole suite of products but how do you think about at revenue attribution and and kind of stating it in an accurate way yeah um attribution is very tough in in today's day and age in e-commerce in my opinion um there's a few ways actually there's two so new customer revenue versus returning customer revenue um understanding that as like a number and a percentage what percentage of people uh that order this month are returning versus versus new. Um, and then just overall attribution to email SMS. We see that like 30% is like a pretty healthy place to get to. So if you can get your email attribution to about 30% of your revenue, that's great. You can get towards 50, that's awesome. Um, but sometimes you can have too much email attributed revenue or you could have too much returning customer revenue. Uh, there's, you know, you always need to be acquiring customers at a certain rate. Uh, because if you're not and you're only relying on email or returning customer revenue or whatever the case may be, to me, it's actually the sign of like a dying business. We've had clients that uh, we, we had 70% attributed revenue to email. And that was like a bad situation to be in. Although we were doing a great job, they weren't acquiring customers. They weren't doing things through other channels. They didn't have meta running. They, there was things that like so it, it's it's interesting you want to have a healthy mm -hmm. balance of new customers and returning customers and you also want to have a healthy balance of channels so top of funnel email like all these different channels um there's kind of like a natural healthy position to be in for all these kind of metrics and so we try to aim for you know healthy returning customers so that we feel there is enough new customers coming into the system and healthy email attribution. So we feel like the other channels are still kind of carrying their weight, um, which is very That's important. Great. That's great. And are you, are you, um, do you feel like you're able to help kind of, uh, when people look at retention, obviously there's, there's brands that have all ranges of retention, some very good, some not so good how much do you feel like your efforts can kind of move that band and move the needle in an area that is obviously dependent on a lot of things that are not necessarily in your control? Yeah. Um, I guess the answer is I wish I had more control. 
But the truth is that a great product and a great, you know, just a great product in general is going to carry most of the retention. Um, even good shipping, like if someone got something in two days versus 10 days, like good product experience, good product in general, uh, these things are most of retention. My job is just to remind people, hey, like, let's say it's a beverage company and the average consumption cycle is 35 days. So they get a case of beverages and it takes them on average about 35 days to consume them. On day 36, I'm just that gentle reminder that's like, hey, did you run out? Like time to restock. Here are other flavors. Um, so, you know, if they didn't have a good time with that initial 12 pack of beverages on day 36, when I remind them, it's not going to do much. And so I'm just that extra 20% of polish just to really send the right message to the right person at the right time and make sure they're being introduced to new products and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but at the end of the day, the product and the product experience, that is most of the retention. I'm just here to kind of fill in the mm -hmm. gaps. When you, when you think about the levers you have control of, you got subject line, you got image, you got copy, you got when it's sent, you got the segmentation. There's other factors too. You got images, buttons. How much does copy play into that? Yeah. Um, I would say it depends on the audience. Um, it, maybe if it's a female audience, like you can maybe be more, again, cute with it. You can be more design. You can be more aesthetic. You can be more, et cetera. Um, and so you kind of just have to understand the audience. Like, does this audience operate and the problem that you're solving and like the category that you're in? Uh, is this something where like brand and design and aesthetic can really push the needle to acquire a customer? Or do I need to figure out a pain point agitate it and then solve it. Right. And so it totally depends as much as that sucks to say in marketing, but if you can identify who your audience is and what you're trying to sell and whether you're solving a problem or you're selling something that's more luxury, you can kind of then use copy and design more so as a tool rather than one or the other. Um, there's plain text emails that rip uh, and there's design emails that rip and it's more so understanding when to use them. Um, and so, yeah, if there's a, if there's a problem that you're solving specifically like PAS as like a framework, pain, agitate, solve, it does very, very well. Um, but if you're not solving a product as much, then it's more so, more so about maybe the aesthetic or the brand or the, whatever that case may be. And so I guess my answer more so is understand what you're trying to do and accomplish and then use copy and design accordingly. There's going to be brands where we're very heavy on design and then there's going to be brands where we're very heavy on copy and so kind of not a one size fits all situation awesome that's super interesting yeah i i think what are some of the the copied angles or or directions that you guys do take or or kind of have internally or do you rely on i guess i'm kind of curious to know like what do you try to do internally versus maybe rely on other other areas outside of your control when it comes to copy. Yeah. So marketing angles is definitely like the word we're trying to think of the different types of problems that this solves and the different kind of relatable situations in which this product can exist. Um, and we're trying to spin it up in a way that resonates with people. And so angling and marketing angles in general, very important. And so something we're starting to offer is just image ads in general. Um, because we're starting to get good at, Hey, like there's this product, here's all these marketing angles from those marketing angles. We can create all these headlines from those headlines. We can create all those body, you know, paragraphs. And so getting really good at like angling a product like marketing angles, and then turning those into headlines has allowed us to one, get better at email because we can spin things up in unique ways. And then two, it's actually helping us with image ads because at the end of the day, once we have a good marketing angle and headline, to get to a good image ad is uh, is easier because that's a big strength of image ads is you're really focusing on like the headline. Um, and so, yeah, we're just trying to ideate as much as possible, look at as many marketing angles as possible and kind of go from there. That's awesome. Do you, how much different do you, um, obviously text and SMS and, and email are very different. How do you kind of get those working well together? Or do you view them as completely separate things or is there some kind of connection between them? Yeah, no, we want to connect them for sure. 
Um, sometimes when we go into a brand, like we fix email and then fix SMS and then connect them. Um, but end game, we really want to connect the two. We, uh, they're very different, right? Like with SMS, you really need to have something worth saying to actually, you know, send it. Um, yeah. I don't want to be sending crappy SMSs that have no relevance. Like it's either my best offer or it's something really worth texting about. Um, and then on email, you can kind of send more f uh, fluff or content or just like nice to have stuff to be sent out the door. Uh, and so that's kind of how I think about it is when do we have something that's amazing to say, let's support with an SMS. Um, and then the base of the funnel is more like email built. And then we kind of plug in SMS when it's like, okay, this is important. Let's send it out. But we're very sparing with the SMS. Um, that's, yeah. a, that's an even more extreme example of clearing the funnel. Like if you, and, and, and that's a place where you can get offer fatigue very easily. It's just blasting SMSs. Like, I can't name a more annoying thing than getting blasted with SMSs. And so yeah. we're very intentional about we are clearing the funnel or this is just something that's worth saying, or this is a moment that we really need to dig deep uh, with the offer. And, and so that's how we think about Love SMS. It. And then we just, yeah, we use that to support email. And so they, they work it. together, hopefully. That's awesome. Very cool. And uh, just switching gears a little bit, fun fun question. What, what's a product you bought a uh, hundred bucks or less that you just love right now or stoked about? A hundred bucks or less. Oh, I have it right here. It's the Shopify counter. <laughs> have you seen oh, this? Oh, amazing. I have, but I, I, I don't think quite in this context. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we're doing a, a brand launch with a client right now and we launched yesterday. And so I have this counter next to me and it's, uh, it's in real time. And so I'm, I'm keeping tabs on it even at, during this podcast. Um, but yeah, it's super oh my cool. God. Great addition to the, to the office. Definitely get one. I mean, I, I, I think we're going to need to talk about that. Cause I think we need one for, for everybody, for all yeah. of our clients. It would be a great Love gift that. to give a client. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Good call. What uh, what books have inspired you lately? Yeah, um, anything on human behavior. I have this book, Priceless, William Poundstone. It talks about like the myth of fair value and how price isn't a real thing and everything is relative, and it just talks about human behavior in general. And those are the kind of books I like to consume. I think it kind of shows me that I am interested in brand building because I am interested in human behavior and consumer behavior. Um, and so, yeah, anything in that realm, I, I like to consume. It's very interesting to me. I love it. This has uh, been really interesting and fun and lots of learnings that you've shared. Bobby, it's really, really appreciated. Excited to see uh, all the success of your agency uh, now and in the future. And we'll probably see you, uh, touting some really cool brands down the line as well. Hell yeah. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Heck yeah. Uh, for folks in the audience that want to connect with you uh, and, uh, and follow you, where would they, where would be best to find you? Probably Twitter. Um, so Bobby Callahan underscore. I, I like to tweet. Um, not, not much of a presence on LinkedIn yet. So maybe one day you can find me there, but for now, just Twitter. Rock on, man. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate the time and uh, have a great day. You too. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bobby. Bye.